Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Burn the Wagon, where we're here to burn the wagon that is, hello, where we're here to burn the wagon that is capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. Today's guest is going to be Sheridan, so I'm just going to invite her real quick. Hello. Hello. Very nice. Thank you for having me. Thank I mean, you thank for you. Thank, me. Thank you for coming <laughs> on today. Sorry. All good. All good. Happy <clears throat> Friday. I feel you. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I'm just gonna do a little little prayer real quick, and then we'll we'll get started on the questions that I got for you. Okay. Cool. I just want to send prayers out there for all the people suffering from de domestic violence. I want to send prayers out there all for all the people that are suffering from mental health issues. I want to send prayers out there for anybody that's gone missing or has been murdered. I want to put prayers up for yourselves for being here today. I want to put prayers for Mother Earth. So thank you for Mother Earth for being allowing us to live here today. So today on Burn the Wagon, where we're here to burn the wagon, that is patriarchy, capitalism, and colonialism. I have my guest Sheridan here. So we'll go ahead and get yourself an intro and say hello to the people that are in here so far. Yeah, let's get into it. So... Aloha, aloha yaoi, aloha, aloha oko, aloha mai kako. Hey everyone, um, my name is Sheridan Noilani Inamoto, and I'm just going to do a real, real quick kind of uh, intro in Alelo Hawaii or Hawaiian language, and then we'll just kind of just jump into our good combo awesome. for our Friday. Um, so, um, Sheridan Noilani Inamoto, kui noa, o. Chakchai ama ku aina o boyam puyak ku umauna o ashokauna ku kahavai o tokau ku umauna. So aloha and hi everyone. Um, so I, I have to really quickly not only introduce my name, but I wanted to introduce where I live and the land in which I reside currently, which is Akchakchai Ama or Southern Pomo lands. And the language that I was sort of speaking was not only in Hawaiian, but I was also speaking in Chaknu, which is the language specifically of where I live, which is also known as Santa Rosa, California, specifically wow. this area. There's also a uh, Kosmiwak, and Wapo relatives that are also in nearby villages, but I literally specifically live in Pomo, in the Pomo part, or at least the Akchakchai um, Ama part. And I also wanted to share the importance of introducing my watershed, um, my mountains, um, Boyampoyak, also known as Mount Shasta, um, which is further north, actually, but I really, I'll talk about that. I'll get into that later. But also, you know, my river, um, the Ashokauna is a word for the Russian River, as people know okay. it as more here, yeah, where I live. And then also um, the ocean, or really the beach, um, which is Tokau, is like Bodega Bay, is also known as. But it's really important to acknowledge that who I am and how I'm able to even live and survive is made possible by the watershed and the lands and the earth that feeds us. And so essentially, um, I only told you a part of my genealogy or our mo'oku aoha, which we would say in Hawaiian. Um, but really, um, I cannot just talk about my grandmas and my ancestors or my kupuna or my elders. Yes, they're, or my parents, you know, they're part of my genealogy, but in Hawaiian practice, it's not only our kanaka or human realms or human people that are part of our genealogy, it's also the lands that feed us uh. and um, make us who we are today. But from there, I'm just gonna say, I was born and raised actually um, in Tongva lands, which is also known as Southern California, um, on a misty morning, April day. So uh, my birthday is gonna be coming up soon. Coming up. Um, yep, yeah, in uh, Harbor City actually. And um, I'm going to start this way. I usually don't kind of begin my story or really introduce myself talking about hula. But um, from a really young age, um, I always had a love of land and nature, music and movement. Hula. I remember watching, there were like hula competitions and um, Kiki Hula, there were all kinds of 
competitions for young people actually in hula but not so much about the competition as much as that i just loved hula i loved everything about hula and most people don't really know what hula is um but i started when i was 10 and um my mom i remember saying that i really wanted to 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 learn hula when wow. i was really young and my dad used to say that when i literally was born when i came out of the womb he knew um he wasn't surprised that i wanted to dance because i came out shaking and already dancing <laughs> so that was actually part of my birth story but um specifically hula though i really loved hula it was this really beautiful connection between music and nature and story that i knew that i loved but i didn't quite know why i loved it so much but i knew that's where it was for me and i actually started learning um in southern california with um a kumu hula or hula teacher kanani kalama so even though i was born and raised i was actually more well, i was born in california um my father is kanaka maoli or native hawaiian a uh, scottish english japanese and he was born and raised in makawao maui and then my mom is actually um african american she's also kato kato um from east texas the reason why we have texas as a name is actually tejas and um punjabi roots and she was born in uh south dallas and my parents actually both my dad from maui and my mom from texas or tejas really came together in california was at the middle place they were met, they met um through my mom's cousin on a blind date <laughs> wow. on valentine's day um actually yeah true story um and they both came out to california because of just realities of education you know um but also what are you going to do um uh, my mom came from the like a place of like segregated south my dad was coming from an island land which was pretty much for native people had its own history and oppression and colonial legacy that still exists today um because it's illegally occupied it is not really a state um and so it's interesting that both of my parents came together in this place um with its own uh in, you know obviously uh his story and impact as well that has also given birth to my sister and I one older sibling and myself wow. but we used to travel back and forth fortunately my mom worked in the airline industry so it made it even easier but i used to go to um hawaii for at least four times a year from the time i was a baby it was my first plane trip my first plane ride and i would go to maui um a lot and so even though i was kind of more or less in tongva lands and you know kind of there i was traveling and really involved in the pacific islander hawaiian culture um in 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 a variety of ways including my family. So even my mom um she was also really involved with my dad in the Hawaiian community, the Kanaka Maoli community and Pacific Islander community in Southern California. Something a lot of people don't realize is actually a lot of people in the Pacific, specifically Hawaii, because of the cost of living and um it is so challenging to actually live there. We are finding ourselves um at least native Hawaiians are finding themselves like not being able to live in their homelands um which is you know indigenous people know all too well in a variety of ways um we can go in so many ways with that but for me i can say that what brought me into my own culture um and just ancestry and practice was just my own uh, and even my education came through my love of my wanting to know about my own family their cultural practice like either at a young age and hula was a part of that um and it's nice to be able to talk about hula first um because hula is not just dance it yeah. doesn't actually mean that hula um right price out of paradise see that um yeah but hula is not just a dance it actually means movement okay um it is the word for movement and so i was um attending a really awesome workshop um through uh or it was through kumu they're both kumu um lanakila and also manguel and also um kamaka eva which is part of who's part of the kanaka ole kanahele family and they were traveling um 
on the continent, as you'd say, or on this side of the Pacific, um, talking about Mauna Kea and protecting the Mauna Kea, which I'm going to also talk about in a, in a bit. But um, I really, but one of the things they, they asked all of the people, we were at this like gathering for hula, but they asked, you know, people like, you know, can hula exist without nature? Or can nature, you know, and can, or can nature exist without hula? Uh -huh. Vice versa. And if you think about it, can nature exist without hula? Yes, 100%. But can hula exist without nature? No. So what hula really is, is a movement. But it's really an embodiment and a reflection of human participation in nature, in revering and honoring and respecting the movement of the lands in which we're in relationship with, that feeds us, that sustains all life, but we're in constant reciprocity through movement. So literally, we are, in many ways, hula is also part of a cycle. It's mimicking that when you sweat, when you dance and you're sweating, or that perspiration coming off, or that breath, or that air, it's like the mist, it's like the water cycle. And literally, you, you become part of that cycle when you are, you are doing hula and movement in nature. Um, you are embodying the natural cycles and rhythm. I mean, that's why hula dancers adorn themselves in lei or like of flowers and fern and all of those different things because they're in relationship, they're in connection too. And so what you get often though about hula is this Hollywood version. This, um, and that has a lot to do with, you know, back, you know, when Hawaii became, you know, under this like US territory and then it also became a state. Uh, illegally, um, it, it, you know, tourism became the number one economy. And with tourism came a lot of cultural, um, uh, what is it, like marketing almost, you know, exploitation, <clears throat> selling of culture and, and, and appropriation. And I can honestly tell you that being Kanaka Mo'ole and being Native Hawaiian, um, I've many indigenous cultures, but I would have to say like Hawaiian culture is probably the most culturally appropriated, even almost sold by our own people, because it's a way of living, you know, it's a way of, it's a really, it's a really sensitive area because on one hand, um, culture, you know, learning and that respect and that relationship is really inclusive to the way we are in human life, you know, and at the same time, when you think about the impact of indoctrination and colonialism on an indigenous cultures, especially Hawaiian culture, of being able, like the Hawaiian language was outlawed. It was banned until like 19, to the 19, maybe 70s. Um, so a lot of the, my, my parents' generation, some gener a lot of generations weren't allowed to speak Hawaiian. Um, they would have been punished for it. Fortunately, my great grandmother didn't listen to anybody. And so my grandfather was trilingual. He spoke Japanese, English, and Olelo Hawaii in his household. So wow. they knew they could speak. They only spoke Hawaiian or Japanese language at home, but they had to speak English outside. And so it was really, I was really grateful that my grandfather and all of his siblings were, were fluent in that way. But, you know, it's this really weird conflict between this, you know, it, it wasn't cool to be native. It wasn't even cool to be Hawaiian, actually. But if it was cool to be Hawaiian, it was because it was marketing. It was to be sold to the tourists. It was in a, a way to make a living and to survive in your own homeland. Um, in a way, you know, selling your culture back to you. I, you know, it's really, really weird for me to, you know, um, fortunately, I, you know, I, I had, I was really in love with hula and Hawaiian culture from a very young age. And so I always wanted, I always knew I wanted to be involved, but that's not always the case for Native Hawaiians or for, especially folks who are away from Hawaii and aren't so close to their, to their ancestral homelands. You know, um, I was really fortunate that I, that I had the interest that, it, and that I could do it. And that I, and now that we can, and now I can tell you that because of, you know, another generation of Hawaiians who were really involved like in the 70s and 80s and all of that rich activism 
um, that came revitalized our Hawaiian language. So now that you can literally speak Hawaiian from the time you're, you're you know, in preschool, a baby, keikis, you know, all the way up to university level. Um, and the, the the emergence of Hawaiian language coming back, you know, it used to be 100% fluent, right? But, huh. <clears throat> uh, but no, but we're coming back even with all of that, that there's a sort of resiliency. And at the same time, we're also dealing with those layers and layers of healing and the impact of cultural um, uh, repression and appropriation. And it's just it's a weird, so it's another kind of hula. It's another kind of dance and reality of what we're having to face um, being native in Hawaii at this time. And yet we still have, and even hula itself being able to still be able to, for me to dance it, it's because it went underground. So that was another thing, hula was banned. You weren't even allowed to dance hula. So yeah, a lot of people don't realize that being Hawaiian in Hawaii was not okay, was even surfing. You couldn't even wow. surf because, you know, it was the missionaries had a huge impact um, at the time. Yeah. So people were naked, you know, they didn't have clothes, they were surfing. I mean, why would you wear clothes when you're in the ocean? Um, you know, but so, so there was a lot of that sort of banning of being native. Um, but then, you know, when you could sell it and you could put a price or capital on it, then it's, then it's all of a sudden it became really cool. But it, but fortunately, the authenticity, the, the a lot of what was able to be a lot of cultural keepers kept things underground. And that's what's been able to come and rise back through the, the threads of all of that. In spite of all of that, um, I'm really grateful that our kupuna, our ancestors, or the people before us just didn't listen. Like my great grandmother, they just didn't listen. Or if they did, they just kept it quiet. Yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> anyway, that was a long intro and everything, but I thought we would just jump into it. So. Oh, it's fine. Um, do you get to spend much time in Hawaii? Yeah, I mean, I think as a as a young person, for sure, I was there a lot. I was often. Um, my family's land is on Maui. Okay. Um, we have a lot of kuleana responsibility to take care of that land. Specifically, um, our land is located in East Maui, which is on Haleakala, the mountain, the lower slopes of Haleakala or the Mauna or mountain, um, which means the house of the sun. And so Maui uh, itself sits, there's about eight, there's a lot of actually a few islands in Hawaii that make up the Hawaiian ar archipelago in the Pacific. Uh -huh. Um, but we know more of that eight major islands. Maui is literally next to Hawaii Island or the, the, the large island that's still alive and growing. Um, and from Maui or Haleakala, you can actually see Hawaii Island um, from that side where my family comes from. On the other side of Haleakala, you can actually look over and thinking about those mauna, which are really, really relevant um, and our, you know, all the mountains I've learned are connected. So it's not a coincidence that, you know, my family land, we're tied to Haleakala, we're tied to a mountain, we're tied to a watershed, and that those mountains are also connected. But I didn't really learn the importance of how much Mauna and our watersheds and watershed way of understanding and relationships really affected me until... I got involved with um, movements like Run for Salmon and Indigenous Native Cali, like Native California Indigenous specifically um, movements, which also, you know, are the places of my birth and feed me and where I currently reside. So there's all these relationships and all of these connections that are woven together. Um, yeah. And you kind of touched on it um, about like, when people are doing hula dances, they're wearing flowers, and we see the obviously the commercialized of it, the the, the grass dress. Um, is there any significance to those things, or you know, I, I that obviously you, you touched on it with being like in touch with Mother Earth and stuff. I kind of want to just get more in depth about that stuff because I feel like, especially myself, I only know about the commercialized version of hula. So like, definitely tell people the significance and, you know, obviously you kind of touched on it, but yeah, I kind of want to get on the stuff that the, the regalia that is worn when people are doing the hula. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you for asking. 
So I think it's a really interesting time to talk about hula also because um, one of the largest gatherings of hula or hula festival called Merry Monarch is actually is happening a couple of weeks from now. So you can actually watch it online. Um, and so hula or movement, you have, um, when you become a hula dancer, practitioner, um, you learn, you, you actually learn, now there's some halal or schools of hula that they only learn traditional um, style, um, which means what all that, what that means is like, you know, often referred to as kahiko, but really, you know, hula is hula. But in this case, with a traditional style, it's um, movement without string instruments. So what you often see in commercialization, and you know, a lot of it has to do with like Hollywood and film, just like when you have like Westerns and you see like, well, it's all the same thing with Hawaii. Like you had Elvis, which is cool, but like you had everybody going to Hawaii. Um, and so there was this sort of like performative value of, of hula. Um, even the hula hoop, I don't know a lot of people know that the hula hoop, that's how the hula hoop got its name, but it's actually incorrect. <laughs> it's not hula. Uh, and there's definitely not a hoop um, in that way in hula. But um, but you should, so traditional style or kahiko is chanting, there's mele, there's oli, there's different styles where basically somebody is just doing those movements and is, there's no like ukulele, there's no like implements and those kinds of things. That's what I was going to ask, if there's yeah. any, any type of right. instrument. So, and that's more what we consider just a traditional style of hula. I don't want to dismiss, though, that what you do see as um, more often awana. Awana is a word that's referring to like wandering, kind of like. But, it's, but that is a hula that is accompanied with instruments so ukulele guitar singing it's a lot more um and it's beautiful right there's still element there's still both styles whether it's tradish or like um awana style i will say um and then you have like hapa haoli which is like basically what that means is like both like english and hawaiian words okay um that's all hula, and there's a, they're they're all beautiful, and they all are very significant, um, even when what they're wearing, and everything in hula, whether if you're playing with imp implements and music dancing or even traditional style, everything that you're wearing, everything that you're doing has a meaning, has a significance. It's not just making a lay or, you know, putting something that every piece of even the style of how a lay is woven, whether it's a lay po'o or a lay around you or like, coupe, like you know, everything, every plant, every um, part of that coming together has a significance, has a meaning and is a reflection. Again, you're literally embodying nature. You are honoring that, and even in the language in which you are in, which you are interpreting or sharing, is all connected in relationship, and that there's many different meanings and layers to what you are seeing, even, or how this person or this particular dancer or this teacher who is sharing through their their hula dancer, you know, that relationship, their view of what they are also seeing, or they're sharing something with you. Um, so it's all very meaningful. I think where you get into sort of the the tourists and commercialization is, and the, the, the really the history of like film and Hollywood with the cellophane and the grass skirts and the plastic lay, even for Halloween, um, you see that. And, you know, and then when Moana came out, it's like, it's very interesting, um, Oceania and the Pacific in general. But I think, you know, that's fun. But what happens often and when people are not in that, and by the way, you know, to be a hula dancer, it's not something you learn overnight. You just don't watch a video. There's like a, there's this really great thing going, you know, I've, I saw it on, I think on Instagram even, where this person is, you know, is, is this non-native Hawaiian person who just saw a YouTube video and starts making up movements. <laughs> you 
you know? <laughs> and there was a lot of commentary and then a lot of pushback from Hawaiians who are hula practitioners, who are dancers. And they're like, you don't, you don't understand. You, you just don't, hula is not just making up hand movements and, you know, playing, you know, to Hawaiian, you know, Hawaiian sounding music or making up words or even, or even desecrate or just disgracing the Hawaiian language, even that, you know, um, it's, it's, it's all disgraceful and all disrespectful, really. Um, hula, like any other, I would imagine, um, you know, it just happens through dance, but even through music or when you're a teacher, it's, it's a commitment. It doesn't, it, it's a, it takes years for for a hula dancer to be a, a, a hula dancer really you know traditionally you were born into a hula you were born as a hula dancer and you were literally raised in your as a hula dancer from the time you were you know a young person all the way up that was you that was what you did that's who you were and it's not to be taken lightly the other thing is that hula is a very significant plays a significant role in um ceremony practice in movement practice um and for practical reasons there's so many um and i want to also say that kanaka Maori hawaiian practice is so integrated so even if i'm a hula dancer and i'm making my implement you know every, and by the way like you learn how to make everything you, you learn how to sew, right? You, you gather, you harvest. Um, that's the other thing that, you, again, you, you know, this plastic idea is like, it really is dis disrespectful to the fact that you actually have to go out, ask permission from the forest and where you're gathering every, even in that, in those relationships, right? That's, it's not just, I'm just throwing things together and taking things. There's yeah. always a recipro reciprocity or a, a reciprocal relationship as a hula dancer because you're in relationship and that, you know, that plant person or that, you know, that makes your, even your material that you're making, whether it's a tea leaf, a, like a, like a, you know, a skirt, right? Or even material, even the kappa, we, we have kappa or cloth that's literally beaten and woven. I mean, you can make all of that. I have a kihei that, um, I wear, you know, um, and then that even making the stamp and the ink, every little part of what you wear, right, is significant and has meaning and deserves respect and is in commitment to whatever you're doing. So, so all of that is hula and all of that hula is also working your hands. So if you're doing hula, you're most likely if you're going to be learning how to do la'au lapa'au or working with, you know, healing practices or massage or being a healer or ho'ola, um, actually the same muscles you learn to make certain things are the same muscles you would use for those things like lomi lomi or massage. And so when you're learning in different kinds of method, methodology, in some ways, you're always learning a hula and vice versa, if that makes any sense that there is no like, okay, that's just hula and that's just this over there or me chanting, you know, even breathing, even the breath is a healing practice. Even chanting is a healing practice. Um, and hula is, was a significant part in the protection of Mauna Kea in the stand in 20, 2019 and actually even before that. But for the stand at that time, and which is still continuing, we're still protecting. Um, but when the, the elders and Kupuna were on the mountain and taking a stand, and Kanaka were going to protect Mauna Kea from the building of the 30 meter telescope. Um, I want to just say really quickly that part of, we had aha or ceremony three times a day, every day without fail, as long as people were standing there. So let's and let's that get included hula, let's, right? Let's you you kind of touched because you kind of cut out. Um, yeah. So the reason behind the people oh. people organizing and protesting is the building of a telescope, correct? You said. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, okay. yeah. and I'm sorry. sorry you you, you kind of cut out, so I just wanted to just uh, recap on every so everybody. everybody <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry about this signal. Is this better? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Okay, cool. So yeah, let's just jump into, um, but I hope that I did answer a lot of the hula and the regalia and that kind you of did, question. You did, you did. Okay, Cause, awesome. Cause 
a lot of it makes sense and and it's all like you're saying it's all it's all movement so like like you said that breathing is movement the you you learning how to do those muscles or certain muscle things is is all movement it's all it's all amazing that's all super amazing to learn because i had no idea I, that the that hula meant an actual word for movement you know what i mean i just thought it was some commercialized word that like you know and this is amazing for me because i'm this is the first conversation that i've had with a native hawaiian because i've never been to hawaii and i've told myself i don't want to go until i'm invited by a family that is indigenous of hawaii and i don't want to go i don't want the commercialized in the host staying in the hotels i don't want that type of trip i want a, a straight hawaiian native hawaiian trip so i told myself i won't go until i get one of those trips um but yeah let's get into that that mountain and 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 like you said all mountains are connected and all these rivers are connected all these oceans are connected and i believe that we should fight stand up and fight for all these things like mother earth and if they're all connected we all have the same fight so ew definitely um so yeah with that movement um with that hula mauna kea is one of the is the largest mountain from the bottom of the sea sea floor to the top of its summit um it is a very significant mountain that sits in the middle of the pacific and currently there are i believe 13 telescopes but the reason i always forget this number because i always feel like there's just one too many anyway <laughs> so it's 12 or 13 it doesn't matter there are too many telescopes on the top of a pristine summit that is literally host to rare like one of a kind species in the world it is conservation land for a reason and um it is also a large aquifer that literally feeds the aqua of many or watersheds of many parts of hawaii island and some would even say that Mauna Kea also is significant in preventing severe catastrophic um, climate um, shifts in weather, huge, whether it's hurricanes or huge tsunamis, that it actually plays a significant role in redirecting the weather. Wow. So to, you can look at, you know, the top of Mauna Kea in a variety of different ways. For me being Kanaka, I, I don't see a separation between science and uh, relationships to land and culture. They're always integrated and spiritual practice. They're, they're always integrated to me because the first sciences of, you know, for me is traditional ecological knowledge is essentially our ancestral observation and relationship period, right? So they're the first science and I can say that for Native Hawaiians, you don't live at the top of a summit. There are different realms of people, of, of different beings that exist. And at the top of the summit, but for a very practical reason, there's fresh water, fresh water. We get our fresh water from mountains, you know, from rain, from snow, all of that, yeah. And so, to build or develop to even think about polluting pristine conservation environmental land is 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 just dumb. <laughs> this is like really stupid. It's <laughs> it's just not serving. But you know this idea of astronomy and you know we're trying to you know um, they want to build a telescope. They want to build another one that's like eighteen stories high. Too many. Too big. It's huge. Huge. And it's not necessary. I mean, there's already telescopes there that need to be removed they're not even in use and they have their own pollution that's created because they're staying there a lot of infrastructure exists like that in the world by the way uh not just telescopes but it could be anything it doesn't have to be necessarily telescopes it could have been you know a center or whatever the case may be it does not belong this particular proposal of a 30 meter telescope does not and will not belong on the top of one of the most sacred and pristine mountains in the world but if you keep impacting negatively these mountains or our mountains, we will pay the consequences ourselves. 
But yeah, we're trying to go off into these other planets in these other places. But we don't even have our our deep understanding or connection to the world in which we live. Yeah, I was so, telling I was telling somebody earlier. We, I mean, we've been fighting for our land since 1492, and we're not going to stop just because we're here to like you know, like they're still doing doing wrong to our lands today. So like, we're not going to stop until we get it back, or they stop building on these. Like you said, stop building this stupid shit in these places. That we <laughs> it's dumb. I mean, it's just pra like on a practical level, it's just dumb. Yeah. Um, and I'm not just trying to like you know just because I'm just pride and all that. No, I mean just for humanity. Doesn't matter if you're native or non-native. You pollute a freshwater aquifer, you pay the consequence. It's the same thing that hap is happening or happened on Oahu recently with Red Hill and the military and their fuel tanks. And it's affecting hundreds of thousands of people's drinking water or water, fresh water in their homes. That's another question I was going to ask you about too, is that the, and it's the Navy doing it, correct? Yeah. That's, I can tell you just from even my time uh, working as a community organizer and advocate in water, which I do, water and water advocacy, climate resiliency, education. I do that work um, in California or on this side of the Pacific, really. But um, I could tell you that the military, the United States military, I'll just be specific, is one of the number one environmental polluters of the world. That's crazy to think about. Cause, and we are the biggest, I think one of the biggest, um, or we have the biggest military, so we're everywhere. We're, we're polluting everywhere, all, all over yeah. the world. We practice. They bomb Pohakuloa, they bomb... RIMPAC is another, um, I really encourage everybody to look into RIMPAC, R-I-M-P-A-C, this international coming together of military to practice and bomb Hawaii or the Pacific. Oceania becomes, has become a field ground for that type of practice for decades. Decades. There are literally islands in Oceania that are no longer inhabitable and then we're still reaping the effects, but even off the coast of California. And they're sinking, you know, new, you know, all of that um, radiation and atomic, you know, nuclear waste, essentially. And, and just because there's no people in these places where they're bombing, it still affects the ocean life. It still affects the water. It affects so many th different things, like the things that get put, the shrapnel or whatever, like from the from the explosives or whatever, you know, goes into the ocean. And things are eating that. Things are soaking that up into their skins, into their gills. It's crazy to think about. It's crazy. And we need to start getting crazy about really being reconnected, being humble and learning from our water, our watershed and um, all of our waters really across. The, because as much as there is this change, right? And this revolution or these, you know, idiotic practices that we're really reaping the consequences at the same time you know because we shouldn't be surprised i always say like the world is round for a reason because what comes around comes you know goes around it's going to come back so we should learn from that <laughs> but anyway we live in a we live in a circle <laughs> we do we live in things that come around but i also believe that if i think about ancestral knowledge and ancestral practice and ancestral wisdom what would our ancestors do what would we do in this time? Like, how, where would we go? What would we do? And I think that for me, they were just so in relationship and so humble and also just really in like observers of the world in which fed them and took care of them and learned the science of it, became part of the science of that. And so I do believe that as much as we're into revolution, there is resolution also but it's gonna have to come to i believe just from my own journey in the past few years of recognizing the importance of source knowledge that how many of us know where our waters come from really not just from our tap not just from our showers not just from you know nestle and um crystal geyser and their bottled water companies
in plastic, which is another issue that we're having to deal with. You know, um, I've learned through movements like Run for Salmon, um, over a 300 mile journey um, that was visioned early, like 2016 by Chief Kathleen Sisk of the Winnemo Wintu. I've learned that real water should be mineral rich because of salmon, because of healthy watersheds that so much so that we should be able to drink fresh water from its source and not have to take any vitamin or mineral supplements. Why? Because water needs salmon, fish like salmon, who live in both fresh and salt water. They bring all those nutrients from the ocean and they feed our fresh water and vice versa. And they feed all of these relationships that are healthy relationships that like, like for generations, like, you know, <laughs> thousands and thousands of years, these relationships, you know, and I do believe that if we let watersheds be just like we noticed in COVID, when we all had to, you know, humble ourselves and be quarantined and stay away. Look how nature recovered. Yeah, there's tons and tons of stories of that, right? Of like, whales coming back and dolphins and, and Sam, you know, just everybody just kind of coming back. And I do believe that when we get out of the way, and we humble ourselves, and take down these dams and free our rivers and free our waters and stop implementing new water infrastructure, for example, when we really like start learning from not dominating, you know, then I do think nature will take care of itself and result and it will come back right away. Like, I don't think we have to do much. We just have to believe we just have to let people let nature do what it's done for thousands of years, you know, People who are stuck inside can, can go out there and fuck the world up and everything started getting better. Now we're back and... Right. And we're like, oh, we did we learn anything? You know, isn't that always the case? Why is it there is there ignorance? Um, why do we have a precautionary principle when we don't use it? I and what with... are we really learning, you know? And it's like, hmm, I think our ancestors are... You know what? We don't... You know, our ancestors don't get... Our native ancestors don't get enough credit for, you know really learning from their mistakes. That's true. Cause I was, I was speaking with somebody earlier in, um, and they, uh, about the basket making and you know, how many, how, how, how many hours and how many days had to be sit there and put into like, what kind of basket is being made for, for holding salmon? What is kind of, what kind of baskets made for holding acorns, you know, and what kind of, you know, the different, the different types of baskets that had to go in there. And they learned from, like you said, they learned from those mistakes. Like, oh, this, this design didn't help with the, the holding the water or whatever for our, our, um, our water, or they didn't hold the right for salmon or whatever, you know what I mean? So it's, it's a lot of like sitting there doing it and sitting there with your tribe and learning from each other is all amazing, you know? And like you said, learning from those mistakes that you did prior or whatever and, and fixing it and going forward, you know? So, um, and you kind of touched on Run the Salmon, so I kind of want to get, get on that and um, what got you started up there. And obviously, one question that I, I had somebody else talking about the Run for Salmon that I didn't ask, and I want to, what time of year do the salmon run from the river to, or from freshwater to uh, um, the ocean? Such a, thank you for that question. Um, so what I've learned is that there are four runs of salmon which is why it's called the run for salmon. Ah. So there are four runs and more or less seasons. There are seasons. When we talk about the movement or really prayer journey ceremony called run for salmon, we're also specifically referring to one of those runs of salmon, but really all salmon, but, but specifically more or less sturdy, hardy winter run Chinook salmon on this side, they would say that. But really, there's a run of salmon, right, that were believed to be extinct, mainly because of uh, the dam, Shasta Dam, uh, that was put up and covered up villages of the Winnemong Wintu, ancestral burial site, the whole thing. Um, and it also depleted runs of salmon that are native to those that particular watershed this is a very specific watershed it's one of the major watersheds of california that 
actually provides most of our water. Most of our water obviously comes from mountains. So it's not, you know, it's not just the Sierras. It's also Boyampoya or Mount Shasta that feeds the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River. And here we go. And those are two major rivers on this side of the Pacific that really feed and get diverted. And tons of water always constantly gets diverted to the Central Valley and even further south. And then Southern California has its own uh, relationships like with Owens Valley and the depletion of those watersheds. But all this to say that with this particular type of salmon that were indigenous to this particular watershed, the, the Winnemum, the Middle River, um, Waiwakit, that particular run of salmon were sturdy fish. And they thought they were no longer, they were no longer coming up. And they thought they were literally extinct. But then their eggs back in the late, I believe, 18 or 1900s, I always get that timing confused. I think it was the late 1800s. They were shipping fish eggs because people wanted their salmon. Yeah. But some of them ended up in Aotearoa in New Zealand and they became really sturdy. And they survived. And so the run for salmon really is to bring a particular run of salmon that they believe to be extinct, that are living and surviving and thriving in Aotearoa or New Zealand, another Oceania, keep in mind, Pacific nation, and bring them back to their native watershed. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, they are there's a variety of salmon. There's coho salmon, this is Chinook salmon, and each salmon has a particular reason for a season, like they have a particular build. So what you need for this particular run, which is why it's so important to bring them back from these native species is because they're really, really hardy. They have to be able to jump really high mountains. They have to jump. Now, if you know about salmon, right? Um, when they're coming in, it's usually when, when we did the first four years of the run for salmon, it was in the fall. And we were following the salmon coming back to spawn and lay their eggs to die or to come back home. So that was in the fall, which is more or less the rainy wet season would be, um, you know, when the waters are high, um, there's lots of waterfall, there's waterfalls in that, in that watershed. And so the waters, when there's a lot of rain, um, that less, you know, it's easier for the salmon to jump to go back and literally they're going upstream against the currents to some, so they've spent their time in the ocean and the salt water and then they've moved to the fresh water. Ah. Um, so that's kind of like in the winter, right? But then for the small frides in the next four years, which we're going into our seventh year this year, which is gonna be happening in the summer, it's a closed ceremony though, unfortunately because of COVID, but, um, but it, we're doing it in the summer because the small fry, so say that the, the salmon, they're, they're kind of existed, they, they've, they've been in their fresh water, and then they just instinctively know, they're like, okay, it's time to go to the ocean and make our way to the journey out to the ocean. And so these next four years have been dedicated from going from the mountain, their birthplace, all the way out to the ocean for the whales. Wow. To bring the whale relationships together, yes. Yes. So, you know, salmon, right, are a keystone species for a reason, not just for the bears, for, you know, the other uh, river um, relatives and, you know, beings and, you know, not just for humans, obviously, but for the ocean. Yeah. That's what I was going to touch on, too. If they feed everything from bears to the little tiny fish that live in there to the the soil that's in the in the in the rivers or whatever it feeds so much so much of the ecosystem that we're not we're not paying attention to exactly so there's seasons of salmon there are four runs of salmon which is why it's called run for salmon actually um but we are also committed in that way the way that salmon are committed and they're also one of the most i've learned through this journey of following this particular watershed. So the run for salmon literally is over 300 miles and we walk and we run and we bike and we, we paddle and we do horseback riding sometimes. I mean, it's, it's pretty much someone, you know, it's like the indigenous Ironman <laughs> wow. activity, but you know, there's just so much when you learn from the source and you learn about resilience and resistance, you learn what it means to be really selfless. I think salmon to me are some of the most selfless creatures in the world. 
Is they literally give up their lives for other people, for other beings to live. That's that's amazing. That's super true. Um, man, I just saw Stewie G pop in here. He's gonna be my hey. next. I, yeah, my guest next week. So I just wanted to say what's up to him. <laughs> hey, bro. Um, if he's still in here, um, yeah, that's that's amazing to think about. Um, and you said that's gonna be in summer, but it is gonna be a closed. Um, it's a closed ceremony again this year. Yeah, but but, there, but I do want to say real quick to follow Run for Salmon in July because we're gonna be, or June, July, follow us. We're gonna do a teach week. Um, we have Run for Salmon education and we're gonna have um, walk your watershed activities for um, a few weeks. So even though we're following a particular watershed, we would love for all of everybody to join us and walking your own watershed and knowing who your waters are and what you notice about what's going on. Because here's the thing, the reason why a lot of those of, you know, a lot of things are happening in the mismanagement of water is love. A lot of it is just ignorance. People, they're banking on ignorance. They're, they're, you know, corporations, uh, industrial agriculture, they're banking on the fact that you don't know how water moves. You don't know who has water rights or invested. They're, they're, they're literally making a profit off your ignorance. Literally. You know, we're paying water bills, right? We're, you know, but we really don't know what a healthy watershed infrastructure and healthy water is because we've always been sort of colonized um, in, our, in our mind, really. Absolutely. In our, you know, uh, structurally. Yeah, Absolutely. And um, what was I gonna say? I was gonna say something. Damn it, I forgot. Oh darn! I I forgot. Um, but was yeah, it, it, or yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, oh, it was. Um, I was gonna tell people here in because I live in Santa Cruz, and I there's a couple people watching that are in, from Santa Cruz, and we're on Amamusin oh, um, territory. Yeah, so I think it's the Pajaro Pajaro River River, and then the San Lorenzo River here. So yeah, if um, if we can. Um, we can maybe have get some people here together on um, and do that here and walk the river here. Um, but yeah, it, does anybody in here on the live have any questions for us? Um, Cause I believe that's all the questions I had for you. If you had anything that you wanted to promote, like the run for salmon page, I'm going to tag them when I post this. Um, anything else yeah, yeah, that you wanted to promote? And if there's any other topics I didn't bring up like MMIW, um, yeah. If, I don't know if that's a big issue in Hawaii and um, over there with you guys, but I know it is with, uh, obviously, you know, here in California and along the United States. Um, yeah, just go ahead and tell people. Anything. Yeah. Um, so hopefully you, everybody will get these links later, but for sure, Mauna Kea Education and Awareness has an Instagram page. Follow us. People are still standing and protecting Mauna Kea. Um, it's not over yet, unfortunately. Um, but the 30 meter telescope has not been built, a, eh? and it's it's a really huge, amazing um, stand. So that's awesome. The other thing I want to share is run for salmon. So run the number four salmon. Um, follow them on Instagram. Like I mentioned, walk your watershed. You can be with us. Figure out who your watersheds are and start getting involved um, and getting educated about that. And I also want to do a little shout out to um, Manoa Honua, which is. Um, offering so many amazing Hawaiian methodology um, practices in Hawaiian land stewardship and understanding. And um, you can check them out on Instagram, but really check out, they have their website link and you can find out more. Um, during COVID, it was a really great opportunity for those people, especially Native Hawaiian myself, who are not necessarily in Hawaii, um, to still be connected and stay involved with cultural practice and methodology. But it is open to other folks, especially um, other Native folks who, you know, who are, are wanting to learn more about each other and just kind of have inspiration and encouragement to keep going because we're all connected and we're all very much woven together, especially Absolutely. through our waters, you know. I was trying, um, to, I was trying to rep them. today. Hey, I love it. <laughs> hey, all right. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. I was like, so. I'm going to try to find my one Hawaiian shirt that I got. <laughs> I'll have just anyone. Yeah, definitely. Um, I want I want some some more Hawaiian shirts for sure. Like standing, like I like I like um you know just like standing up shirts like like what we're what we're oh, doing. I got, you know what I, mean? I, got yeah. I got like a this is a Eva bird. Oh hell yeah, that's cool. it. it's pretty Absolutely. dope. 
<laughs> it's a seabird. And um, if they got a, if they got an Instagram, plug it. Tell them, tell people to go follow. Yeah. So just you know, it's actually this month is uh, Native Plant Month. So I, I also encourage you to look up your native plants that are indigenous to your area, which are also an important part of our watershed. Don't get enough credit. Um, same thing with Hawaii, Native Hawaiian Plant Month. I've been following that. It's been pretty cool. Wanted to shout out for that. Yeah, I don't know. I don't see any questions, but yeah, uh, you can always, you know, hit yeah. me up on my my handle too. Yeah, definitely give her a follow. Uh, we think we got one comment. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today. Okay. So yeah, thank you very much. Uh, much love and appreciation appreciation for you share. Um, so yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna share this and. Um, Definitely um, send it to you. If, if you want to send me your email, I can give you this, this full video. Thank you for coming on today. I really. Thank you. Yeah. And shout out to Sui G. He's coming up next. Yeah. Yeah. He's next weekend. And actually, he has a dope show tonight. Um, yeah, I know. I, yeah, yeah. So hopefully he kills it out there. So, Y'all, if you're going to be outside of Stockton, um, you know, plug, plug. It'd be a really yeah. great concert tonight for Sui G and, H and um, you know, HGS, Savage Fam. So love yeah, yeah. to them. That's my bro. Thanks. Speaking of run for salmon. Well, hey. Salmon will run and then Sheridan is amazing. So thank you very much. <laughs> Likewise. I don't, I don't want to see it cut off. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So you can just go ahead and uh, exit out on the with exit? the X. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone for joining me today, joining this discussion. Go follow Sheridan on uh, her page. Follow everything that she's doing. Once I post this, please share this. If you know anybody that wants to join me, definitely hit me up. Uh, go and subscribe to the YouTube page. And yeah, share, like, and yeah. Burn down the wagon that is patriarchy, capitalism, and above all else, fucking colonialism. Peace.